Welcome to the Brain Shape Podcast, hosted by Dr. Andrea Wilkinson, a show where we cut through the noise of the ever-growing, ever-changing world of brain health. What works and what doesn't, what's fact and what's fiction. We look at tips, tools, and techniques backed up by real scientific studies to help you keep your brain healthy and hopefully have some fun along the way. Now, here's your host, Dr. Andrea Wilkinson. You're listening to the Brain Shape Podcast, episode number 35. Many of us believe that helping others is a virtue. We want to contribute to our communities and give back to society through, for example, volunteering, helping our neighbors, and making charitable donations. Today, we're talking about how pro-social behavior changes with age and taking a deeper look at what motivates these types of behaviors that ultimately contribute to building stronger communities and a healthier society. If it's true that older adults are more prone to pro-social behavior than younger generations, how can we learn from older adults' pro-social tendencies and instill these values in younger adults? To help us better understand the components of pro-sociality and potential motivators, we're speaking with Dr. Julia Spaniel an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Ryerson University. Julia holds the Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Aging and directs the Memory and Decision Processes Lab at Ryerson University. Her lab studies a variety of different topics, including cognitive functions such as attention, memory, and decision-making in younger and older adults, and she also explores motivational influences on cognitive functions across the adult lifespan. Here we go. Here's Dr. Julia Spaniel. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Hi, Andrea. You're very welcome, and thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to chat with you today, but I'm hoping that we can maybe start with talking about your background and how it is that you got interested in psychology and aging. Hmm, sure. Um, So my background is I grew up in Germany in a small village, actually, and um, I was always interested in travel and different cultures, and I um, wanted to move as far away as possible <laughs> when I finished high school. So I, I took a gap year in, uh, in Mexico, which was a big, uh, big step for me. And while I was there, I volunteered in a nursing home just in the community. And that was really my, the first time that I started to think about, you know, aging and just how diverse people's life stories are and how different different people's personalities are, how uh, different individuals cope in different ways with the with the aging process. Um, all of those things. Of course, I wasn't thinking about this in a scientific kind of way. I just made those observations for myself. But then, when I entered university uh, as an undergraduate in Germany, I was drawn to um, a research group at my university there in Trier that did lifespan developmental psychology. So the psychology of studying what how things change um, as we grow older, and I. I found that really fascinating, and I then continued with that focus during my graduate studies uh, on this side of the pond in the in the in the United States, um, and in my postdocs. And finally, I arrived at Ryerson University in 2007, and I'm very lucky to be uh, in a university and specifically in a in an academic department, the psychology department that has multiple other faculty members who are also interested in the psychology of aging. So we get to do collaborative work um, and it's just a very stimulating environment that's really benefited this research program. It is such an interesting area to study. Obviously, it is my passion as well. And we met at Ryerson. So I did my grad school at Ryerson. And I was privileged to have Julia as one of my professors and mentors. So that was such an exciting time for me. And I'm so happy that you were there to help guide me through all of the grad school craziness. (laughs) It was my pleasure, and, and uh, yeah, the honor is all mine, and you were a member of our inaugural cohort of graduate students, PhD students in our program, and that cohort holds a very special place in, in our hearts, and we're very proud of, of you and all the other uh, uh, alumni from, from that first cohort. Thank you. 
So I wanted to talk about a research area that you're currently starting to focus on, prosociality. So can you tell us right. what that is? Yeah, this is indeed kind of a new thing for me. So I'm still very much learning about it myself. But prosociality is a fancy word to refer to a collection of specific uh, thoughts and behaviors and, uh, and actions that are aimed at improving the welfare of others. So things we do for others, but also opinions and values that we hold that have this pro-social orientation. And there's actually no, to my knowledge, overarching real theory of pro-sociality that, you know, that I'm aware of. But um, psychologists and others think that it's, it's a collection, as I said, a collection of traits and beliefs and values and behaviors that all contribute to this pro-social category. So specific examples would be altruism, empathy, generosity, generativity, which sounds very much like generosity, but is, it refers to the idea of sort of setting an example for and giving back to younger generations once you're older. Mm -hmm. um, but also, in addition to these terms that psychologists really like and that we tend to study in our kind of discipline-specific ways, prosociality is also expressed on a broader uh, you know, societal level through a number of forms of um, civic engagement, including uh, things like volunteering, community activism, informal helping, for example, among neighbors, making charitable contributions, um, so donating money, and also political participation. We just had a federal election very recently here in Canada, and um, I don't know about the uh, voter turnout for this past election, but I know that four years ago when we had the previous federal election, more people in their 60s and I think uh, early 70s turned out and went to the polls than, than did younger adults between the ages of 18 and uh 30 something. So, so there is this um, interesting trend that we see in some of these behaviors that connects pro sociality to aging. Very interesting. And I'm wondering if you can maybe talk a little bit about why it's so important to study pro social behavior and age. Yeah, I mean, I think there are many reasons to wonder about that. And um, the first reason, and, and of course, I'm a bit biased here because I am a psychologist and a researcher. The first reason is that we're simply curious about human development, right? So we know, uh, we know quite a bit about child development. And that's a fascinating and very important area of research for sure. And that has a rich history in psychology in particular. Um, Interest in adult development is a bit more recent in the history of our disciplines, but it's certainly become a huge field in the past, I don't know, 30 to 40 years, as you know, because you're also a, um, an academic in this area. And this shift towards the interest in, in lifespan development has, of course, it has to do with many things, including the fact that we are living longer lives, that there simply are more older adults now, proportionately speaking, than, than there ever were before in Canada and uh, elsewhere in the world. And, uh, you know, the statistics are simply staggering of this demographic shift. In 20 years, uh, every fourth Canadian will be, is projected to be age 65 or older. So there is a lot of curiosity about adult development, and that encompasses changes in pro-social tendencies. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. we want to focus not only when we think about aging, there's a tendency to paint a doom and gloom picture to focus on things that decline or that, you know, uh, that we may be losing as we get right. older. Uh, but in the last, again, couple of decades, there's been a noticeable shift of being, you know, stepping back and saying, wait a second, maybe we should begin to look more closely at the things that actually improve and at the, um, the strengths and the, the, the points of resilience that older adults bring to the table. And I think this interest in pro-sociality very much fits into that narrative. So the second reason to care about pro-sociality, regardless of age group, really, is that by definition, pro-sociality is good for society. It brings benefits for, uh, for communities, for families, for 
you know, friends and neighbors. And so it's something that we want to, in our culture, that we want to foster and encourage on a broad scale. Uh, charities are very interested in learning more about who donates and why they're donating and how that can be encouraged. Community organizations depend on volunteers. Families need caregivers. You know, uh, Hillary Clinton said it takes a village to raise a child. Well, that's very true. And, and neighbors depend on one another. And if you add up all of those contributions, prosociality is a real force for the good on a broad societal um, scale. And so it really behooves us to study it and to potentially you know, find out how to enhance it. Um, and if it is the case that older adults are setting an example in that arena, then maybe we can learn from older adults and we can instill those values and those, um, those strengths in other age groups as well. Um, and I think that's also, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot is that in the current cultural moment, there is a general tendency towards individualism, right? So mm-hmm. people move around a lot for their jobs, much more so than was the case in the past. They are less rooted in their communities than they used to be. They're maybe less likely to participate in organized religion than, than they were in the past. Uh, and they, many of us spend a lot of our spare time, not even just our work time, but also our spare time, looking at screens instead of interacting with other people. Right. So pro-sociality is sort of this, this very important uh, counterpoint to all of these kind of worrisome trends. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's another reason to care about how it's changing with age and how we can cultivate and foster it in our culture. And then finally, pro-sociality also brings benefits to the person who is pro-social. It's good for the individual. And we know this from survey studies that uh where people report that as a result of helping others or being engaged in their communities or, you know, simply doing good things for other people, uh, they feel better. They, they, it, it supports their physical health. It supports their mental health, their happiness. And uh, there are also some reports of benefits for cognition. So volunteering is a form of social engagement. Social engagement is a predictor of, positive cognitive or mental health uh, as we get older. So that's sort of a selfish aspect maybe that uh, that pro-sociality uh, brings along and that, that's, a, that's a perfectly good reason for being interested in it, in it as well. Yeah, well, it's absolutely such an important concept, and I'm so happy that you're here to talk with us more about it. So I'm wondering if we can go into each of the different subcomponents of prosocial behavior. So the first one is altruism. So can you tell us a little bit about Mm -hmm. what altruism is? Yeah, certainly. So altruism is the motivation to help others, even if it comes at a cost to yourself. So what that means is that altruistic people are often willing to make sacrifices and those sacrifices can take different forms. It can be monetary, it could be in terms of time, money, uh, or it can involve other resources, uh, you know, social resources, for example. Um, I think time and money are the most obvious examples. Uh, So altruistic people are willing to accept those sacrifices in order to help others or to support causes that they believe in. But it's also possible to express altruism without that element of sacrifice. So, for example, if you imagine yourself getting a pair of free tickets to some concert or some event, and you can't attend that event, well, if uh, if you give those tickets away to a friend or to a neighbor, it's not really a personal sacrifice. You weren't going to go to that to that event yourself anyway. Nevertheless, I would count that as a pro-social or altruistic act because you had to care enough about that other person's well-being um, to offer them their, your tickets, right? You have to go out of your way a little bit to, to take that step. So um, that's a slightly broader definition maybe of altruism than, than you'll find in some places, but I think it's, it suits us uh, for, for the purpose of studying it psychologically. And what does the research say about altruistic motivations and how they mm-hmm. change across time and the, our lifespan? Yeah, well, I already talked uh, or hinted a little bit about um, 
<coughs> excuse me, findings regarding age differences and altruism. Um, uh, I mentioned that older adults go to the polls more, more frequently, more reliably than younger people. We also see that older adults do more recycling um, than younger people, contrary to the stereotype that younger people care more about the environment. It's actually older people who do more for the environment, at least as far as the recycling behavior is concerned. Um, we also know that older people give more money to charity. Um, of course, that could be driven in part by, by their financial status. Uh, so we have to be careful not to overinterpret those data. Um, but older adults are real forces in the community in terms of volunteering and, and activism and so forth. So you asked, what does the research say about how altruistic motivation changes across the lifespan? And, um, it, well, not surprisingly, the, um, the theories are consistent with the findings that I just described. Um, otherwise, they would be they wouldn't be very very useful theories if they were um, if they were at odds with what we're seeing empirically. So, lifespan theories of motivation state that we undergo a motivational shift as we kind of travel through our adult developmental journey. Uh, for example, one framework that's very well known in psychology is called socio-emotional selectivity theory. And that theory states that as when we're young, we tend to focus on what's called acquisitive goals that we want to acquire new information. We're interested in building new relationships, going out there and exploring. Um, my example of taking that gap year in Mexico maybe is, a, is a, uh, an apt example of that young adult emphasis on you know, exploratory behavior. As we get older, the emphasis on exploration uh, goes down a little bit, and instead we start to focus more on emotion regulation and on meaning. So we are less likely to pursue goals that we found in our earlier in our lives to really take us nowhere, and we're more likely to home in on, on goals that essentially make us feel better, not just in the moment, but that give us a sustained sense of meaning and of a, a contribution to, for, to the greater good. And um, so that's the psychological theoretical conception or one of the, one of the frameworks anyway, that paints sort of this rosy picture of adult development in, in motivational orientation. I do think that the picture may actually be a bit more complex than that in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, theories are usually a, at least a little bit wrong. And I think this <laughs> is one of those cases. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, some forms of altruism can be very costly, right? So this notion of sacrifice that often goes along with doing good things for other people, uh, it, it implies that you have to have something to give. So think of the time and the physical health that are required to volunteer in your community or the money that it takes to contribute to charitable causes, right? Um, so my hunch there is that we, if we were able to follow individuals over time and track their altruistic behavior as they grow older, we would, we would see it peaking somewhere in the post-retirement years maybe, but we might you know, ultimately see a decline again um, in, in what we refer to as old, old age, because at that point, people may be more likely to experience health problems and declines in other resources, whether they be cognitive, social, or financial. And so I think, you know, to, to be able to express altruism, you have to also have those resources. It, it, motivation alone is not, is not enough, right? And on the research side, we're still a bit in the dark about, you know, how and why those changes are happening um, in older adults. And, we don't really know, we have a hard time predicting who's going to be particularly altruistic. So individual differences in this trait are really a mystery at this point. You might think, well, it's all about, you know, people who can afford it, you know, socioeconomic status, or it's all about religiosity or spirituality. Turns out nothing is really a clear cut. It, it, we, we, we don't really know. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mystery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's very interesting, because I'm sure you're right in the assumption that you would see this sort of boost in altruistic behavior at some point in time. So perhaps it's around um, retirement age, but that it would then sort of 
decline a little bit because of changes in it could be mobility, health status, finances, all of those pieces that you talked about. And so that's really interesting question because I also wonder about the mental state of the people that really did like uh, executing on this altruistic behavior in their post-retirement age when they were maybe a little bit younger uh, and had more physical strength to do so. And then having those physical limitations come into play, health status changes, they're now limited in their ability to give back and how that affects them as, as being someone who used to love that. Exactly, exactly. And I think also we have to be careful to, when we measure, when we study this phenomenon, which is uh, clearly of, of great interest, uh, you know, to society, but also to us as researchers, that we have to be careful to distinguish between the values and beliefs that people hold versus the behavioral expression of those values. Because they, for all the reasons we just we just talked about, they may not completely map onto one another. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the research is just in its infancy in, in this area. So it's, it's kind of a, it's an exciting time to study altruism. Definitely. Um, so I'm wondering if we could talk about another component of pro-social behavior. So that is empathy. So can you tell us a little bit about empathy and the different components of empathy and how we see any changes um, in empathy across time? Yeah. So this isn't something that I have personally studied in my own lab, but um, what the science says is that there are essentially two components to empathy. There is an emotional component, which is the one that allows you to share somebody else's um, emotional experience and to have sympathy with them. Um, the, the term or the phrase that's often used is like feeling someone else's pain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or feeling their joy for that matter. It doesn't always have to be uh, in a negative context. So experiencing those vicarious emotions. That's emotional empathy. And then there's cognitive empathy. And that's the part that involves perspective taking. So the kind of mental acrobatics that's involved in imagining what it's like to be that other person, suppressing for a moment what it's like to be yourself and really switching the perspective. Yeah, And that's, uh, that's quite different from the emotional piece. And they do dissociate sometimes. So with respect to aging, we know that um, the emotional piece is, appears to be relatively intact in older people. Uh, in fact, there are some studies that suggest that older people might even be more acute or astute <laughs> at, at um, empathizing with others on, on that emotional level. For example, older people will mimic the facial expressions of others that are experiencing joy or pain to a greater extent than younger adults, which is very interesting. And mimicry is, is one part, one facet of emotional empathy. So that part seems to be, <laughs> seems to be working. It's with the cognitive empathy that uh, the research suggests that there may be some, uh, some decline even that is not completely clear cut because, uh, as you might imagine, cognitive empathy and perspective taking can be studied in a number of ways. People use self-report measures, they use behavioral tests in the laboratory, or they use more naturalistic types of measures that, that maybe do a bit more justice to what, what, you know, what people encounter in their everyday lives. Um, and so you, you do get different pieces of information from these different types of research, as is often true in psychology, right? Um, but on the whole, I would say the evidence currently suggests that cognitive empathy, perspective switching, because it requires so much mental agility, mm -hmm. may be more challenging for some older adults. So there are some additional components of pro-social behavior, including agreeableness, cooperation, and trust. So is there anything you can tell us about those three different subcomponents of pro-social behavior and what they mean and how they change across the lifespan and with aging? Yeah, there's some really interesting research on each of those components. So let's start with agreeableness. So this is a personality trait that um, is associated with 
psychological maturity, being warm, friendly, tactful, basically a nice person, a decent human being. And it's one of the, what psychologists call the big five. So these are major personality traits that have received a lot of uh, empirical study by personality researchers. Um, in addition to agreeableness, they, they include extroversion, uh, conscientiousness, emotional stability, which is the inverse of neuroticism. And then uh, the last one is openness to experience. So originally, the conventional wisdom was that personality traits are pretty much set in stone after age 30 or thereabouts, and uh, that after that, we basically don't change. But more recently, the thinking has shifted, and there are uh, studies and meta-analyses that show that, indeed, there are personality changes, quite systematic personality changes, even um, during adulthood and into old age. So, for instance, with respect to agreeableness, which is a, a component of prosociality, because it means you're being nice to other people, right? You're an approachable person. It's been found that, well, if you've always been the most agreeable person in your age group, that ranking, that standing within your cohort will probably remain stable. But your cohort as a whole will shift in the direction as they grow older in the direction of more agreeableness. So people do kind of become a little bit easier to get along with on average, a little bit more fun to be around as they grow older. So you can think of that as sort of an, a maturation, maybe that's, that continues throughout the lifespan, which is encouraging, I think. It's yeah, and know. very encouraging. <laughs> capable of change, right? Yeah. Uh, into our 50s and 60s and maybe even beyond. And then cooperation and trust are the other two uh, concepts that you mentioned. And these two really go hand in hand. So trust, of course, is the belief that other, other humans, uh, others around you are, are truthful and that they're reliable, that you can count on them and that you can make your own decisions and your own behaviors contingent on their cooperation, on their behavior. And uh, the research on aging and trust shows that, interestingly, older people in studies, you know, that, that have been asked, you know, well, do you, how trusting are you? Um, they report being more trusting than younger adults. But then when we look at their actual behavior and their ability to distinguish, say, between trustworthy fa faces and less trustworthy faces, we see a bit of a decline in that sensitivity to these subtle changes or subtle differences, excuse me, in older adults compared to younger adults. So this may be one of those cases where older people's perception of their own trust levels and their, you know, maybe if you want to put it negatively, gullibility, right, is a little bit more positive than, than the reality when we look at it through a more objective lens, you know. Um, but I think that um, in general, this work on age differences and trust is really still very young. And we need a lot more research to understand uh, in what situations older adults may be in particular prone to uh, being taken advantage of because they are too trusting, right? And there's reason to think that that's a concern because, uh, because older adults hold a lot of the, the, the wealth in our society um, they have savings, et cetera. So they are targets for scammers and frauds and so on. And a lot of this is happening online. Yeah. And I recently read a statistic whereby the incidence of these attempts to, to scam older adults is actually um, higher than the incidence of uh, a lot of age-related health uh, risks and neurodegenerative disorders. So you're more likely to become the victim of uh, at least an attempt, um, a fraud, fraudulent attempt on you, then you are to develop Alzheimer's disease. That doesn't mean wow. that you're going to, to be the victim. You know, older adults are, are not, um, they're not helpless and, and they do have a lot of life experience and wisdom and they don't just say yes to everything um, on average. But there is a sense that they are particularly vulnerable because because of the, the medium that is often used by scammers. So, you know, the, the internet, um, 
being being the medium of choice. Um, and then also because, again, they hold a lot of financial resources that make them attractive targets. And interestingly, it's not always strangers who take advantage or who try to take advantage. It's often family members as well. Wow. Very eye-opening for sure. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the specific research that you are um, planning on doing on pro-social behavior and aging? Tell us about what you are exploring and what you're interested in learning more about. For sure. Well, so this, as I mentioned earlier, it's a relatively new research theme in my lab. And um, to be honest, it's really been driven primarily by my graduate students. They're really teaching me um, this, this, this new area, and I'm very grateful to them. And um, the, most, uh, the most important person in, in that context is my graduate student, Erica Sparrow. And Erica's work, or our joint work so far, has shown that um, that we've basically brought altruism into the lab. We've devised tasks where we're giving people a choice between, between making altruistic financial decisions and making selfish financial decisions. And we've shown several times now across several studies that older adults are more um, altruistic in the sense that they're willing to part with um, a financial endowment that we give to them at the start of the study more easily than younger adults, and they're even willing to wait longer to make those uh, charitable contributions than younger adults are. So they are more patient <laughs> about making those charitable contributions, and they end up contributing more. And again, this comes out of an, uh, an endowment that we give them at the beginning of the study. So it's not the case that this simply reflects that older people have more money to give. We level the playing field and we make sure that everybody has the same budget, as it were, at the beginning of the study. And so that lends some additional confidence that this is a true difference between younger and older adults and not merely a side effect of one group having more money in the bank, as it were, than the other. Mm. Uh, we've also looked at the impact of stress on altruism and prosociality in younger and older adults. And interestingly, we found that younger adults, when they're highly acutely stressed, when they're upset about something, they're more likely to be generous um, and they, are, they, they, they become nicer in a way <laughs> um, and uh, become more altruistic when they're, when they're acutely stressed, maybe in order to sort of regulate their own emotions and make themselves feel better and overcome that negative sense of being really stressed and being really worried. Whereas older adults, they experience the stress as well, but they respond to it differently. They, they're actually equally altruistic and generous uh, regardless of their stress level. So the stress doesn't really change that. It's a, it's a more well-established and and consistent trait that, that the older adults in our studies have displayed. So again, it sort of suggests that there really is something systematic about age-related changes in altruism, and we want to follow up those findings now. So in terms of next steps, we're interested in looking more closely at what happens in the brain when people make altruistic decisions. So we have a study ongoing where we're doing just that. People make financial decisions that benefit themselves versus other people or charitable organizations while they're undergoing uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. So while we're taking pictures of their brains and we're really looking forward to the results of that study because they'll be among the first to, to really shed light on those age differences that we've already observed in, in the lab. We're also going to look at the relationship between cognition and altruism and aging. And we are hoping to start a longitudinal project that'll allow us to follow people who have recently retired from the workforce and follow them over time, follow them for a period of years to learn more about how prosociality changes during that critical post-retirement phase. This really hasn't received much study to date at all. And we're, we're really excited about this research direction, as well as about the brain-related research direction as well. Well, it all sounds incredibly interesting and exciting. And so if there are any listeners that would like to get involved in this research, is that possible for them? 
Absolutely. We're always looking for research participants. Andrea, you may remember this from your days at Ryerson. (laughs) I seem to recall it. Yes. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have the Ryerson Senior Participant Pool, which is a a database essentially of community dwelling uh, individuals age 60 and older who are interested in, in participating in research studies. It's not just my lab that we have other uh, partner labs as well. And um, there is no obligation. Once you, once you're in the pool, you are not required to do anything. You can, uh, you simply agree to being contacted on a, um, on a regular or semi-regular basis and um, being asked, you know, is this a study you might want to enroll in? Would you be interested in this study? And so on. Um, so to learn more about the research and about the Ryerson Senior Participant Pool, I would encourage people to visit my lab website. Um, there is a contact form that, that you can fill out and um, that lands in my email eventually. <laughs> and we also have... We also have um, copies of recent research articles in electronic format that people can download. That is excellent. So I will put the link to your lab website in the show notes for anyone that's interested in learning more about how to become a participant, a research participant in some of the incredible studies that are happening at Ryerson University. So Julia, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time and teaching us about pro-social behavior and how it changes with age. It is such an interesting and important topic. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. To learn more about the work that Dr. Julia Spaniel is doing on prosociality and how it changes across the lifespan, you can visit her lab website. I'll put the link in the show notes. And if you're interested in participating in research studies that are taking place at Ryerson University, you can contact Julia's lab about getting enrolled in the research participant pool. Again, you'll find the exact link in the show notes. If you've missed any of this, you can dive into the show notes for this episode and all past episodes at www.brainshape.ca forward slash podcast. To access the show notes from today's episode specifically, just type episode 35 in the search bar and today's episode will pop right up. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that this episode enlightened you on the value of prosociality and encouraged you to reflect on your own prosocial behaviors and the importance of giving back in our communities. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you'll be notified every time we publish a new episode. And since we're a weekly show, I'll see you back here next week. In the meantime, you can follow me on social media at BrainShapeTO and be sure to let me know if there are any specific topics that you want me to cover on the podcast. Until next time, keep your brain in shape. And as always, I've had such a great time hanging out with you.